happy, first of all, to see this room getting full again. Congrats for being awake <laughs> after the great event yesterday. Thank you for being with us. We have a great panel today and a great topic, narratives, future of crypto. My name is Felix. I am uh, pretty long in this crypto space. I am the founder of basically uh, Dash in Asia. We have brought Dash to Asia. Dash, for who doesn't remember, was the first Bitcoin fork. The first DAO in the world started in 2014. We have brought that to Asia, scaled payment systems uh, all around different countries. Now I am building a social commerce metaverse. Um, what that means is that we are building a metaverse where everybody can create a commercial experience, an art gallery, a shop, um, an event, a concert, in a way that you plug and play your room, you get in your inventory and you start selling. The process takes around 20 minutes from choosing your room to selling t-shirts, watches, makeup, whatever you want. Uh, I am also the co-founder of Futerio, that is a consulting company, marketing, consulting, and building. So consider me as somebody who's building a lot in this space. And uh, the ladies and the gentlemen next to me, I think, are pretty similar. George, please start with a short introduction. Yes, uh, my name is uh, George Sebastiao. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been um, in the Middle East for a little bit over 26 years now. But the last seven years helping a lot of the projects associated uh, with blockchain and related uh, technologies. I'm also co-founder of EchoX, which is uh, one of the largest communities across 11 countries. And I think community is a key element. More specifically on the topics that we are addressing today, I, I prefer sometimes looking at technology as more of an evolution rather than a revolution. So I prefer sometimes to use words like um, multiverse rather than just metaverse because there's a lot of mini verses that are going to be created and each one is going to be for very specific purposes and there's the ones that will end up being successful. Uh, we also talk a lot about the value of Web 3.0. I think maybe Web 2.5 is probably a good road to Web 3.0 because I think we're in the process of building Web 3.0. Uh, people always say decentralized, but if I tell you the technicalities about decentralized, you realize that a lot of the things that you're using today are a lot more centralized than they appear. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss at any time. But I think we're taking the necessary steps to enable people that create content or create value or have assets to have a direct relationship uh, with the community in, without having big intermediaries like Facebook, uh, Twitter, Google, or others uh, be in the middle as intermediators. Super. Are they testing? Is that true? Hello? I think you maybe get an echo. Testing. Hello? Okay. Good morning, guys. Are we all awake? How many, how many were at the party till 1 o'clock last night? Oh yeah, I spotted a few faces. All right, so my name's um, Rupert Tell. Um, I've been in the uh, tech space for more than three and a half decades, right at the beginning of the dot-com era, right at the beginning of smart mobile phones with Sun Microsystems, Java, open source foundation. So um, I was right at the heart and at the beginning as a visionary from there, always been an angel and a VC type of an investor as well at the same time. Uh, my journey uh, in terms of the blockchain space started, I guess, 10 years ago where I rejected it when someone offered me uh, Bitcoin in a nightclub saying, you know, your bar bill's cheaper than buying a few of these Bitcoins, are more expensive. Um, and the two years on, uh, after having said it's not going to work, I went in, um, written books, blah, 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 been on stage with some of these guys around the world as well. Um, currently, what we are doing is building a huge ecosystem. So in, for the last four or five years, my whole journey in life is to how to have an impact on one billion people, right? And a lot of people say that, but 
you know, execution is a lot difficult, okay? So we've raised a huge fund, can't say uh, the value, but certainly one of the biggest in the, in the region. And uh, we are actually building an ecosystem where we're gonna have our own digital bank, we're gonna have our own exchange, we are gonna have our own carbon credits, we are very big on uh, carbon emissions, but in a practical way, I don't like the ESG word, but we are doing it on how to save basic common sense ways of carbon emissions, like reducing uh, heat in data centers to uh, lamps to water. Uh, those are the pod, uh, impact projects. The other impact projects we are doing is, uh, and I've been there before fighting with the Microsofts and um, we started Google at Sun. So uh, some of these people where I think the model is very unfair in how they share revenue with us, the clients. So we've built that platform as well. Uh, we've done a financial impact platform. And that whole thing I call my real universe where I have like, I don't know, 800 odd apps on my mobile, how to make it as easy as possible. Uh, Web3 comes into it. We have that happening now within our my real universe uh, ecosystem. And uh, the building reason for that is not only cutting the middleman out, but we want to make sure people can eat, even if they earn $1 per day, or we're saving them $1 per day, then uh, in countries like Africa and India, close to my heart, because born and raised there in uh, Africa. So we want to make that impact. That's the journey. Hi, my name is Diane Pesquera. I'm the VP of Operations and Strategy at Point Labs. Uh, we're building the first full Web3 architecture, and I like to say that uh, we call ourselves like we're in the tech space, but truly it's about technology enabling a philosophy, uh, and I found that quite interesting, uh, especially when we're talking about decentralization. Uh, so yeah, I'm super thankful for being with such an amazing group of experts. I'm more of a baby in the space. Uh, I've been in the tech space for many years, but not in the crypto space. I'm in, in different areas, so I'm very happy to be here today. Fantastic, thank you. And I gotta say, I'm very proud that, you know, a few years later, after these panels have always been guys only, I'm so happy to yeah, see yeah, more yeah, and more yeah. females stepping up. Big round of applause for that. Well done. It's yeah, really yeah. amazing. Like, we see so <clears throat> many great people in the space, and there's so much talent. So, we want to keep this discussion a bit engaged, so I really kindly ask you for kind of short answers and, and, and like a heated discussion. Like you already mentioned it, it's the web two, it's the web 2.5, is it the web three? Like in a, in a very, let's say 30 second nutshell, what are the two elements or the three elements that for you make web three? Actually the, um, the things that I consider the elements obviously is decentralization is being able, the people that actually create the content to deal directly with the community. But to build successful startups in this uh, new domain, we actually three, um, have th need uh, three major <coughs> ingredients and we call this MBC, money, brains and contacts. So you need a good financial structure and investment to allow your startup to flourish. You need to have the creative mm -hmm. people that um, develop the, the product. And I think here we have a big challenge because most of the products that I see today, the user interface is, is bad. Um, let's talk even, for example, something like the metaverse. Most metaverses need you to go back to the desktop. People are not going back to the desktop. People are gonna stay with their mobile. So if your metaverse or your miniverses don't run on the mobile, you're not gonna get mass adoption. And the last one is the most important one is community. Without community, your solution is not going to succeed. So you need to find vertical communities that give traction to the solution that you're trying to create. Great answer. Maru, would you agree or would you, what would you add? <laughs> you said you want a, a debate, so George and me be used to that, all right? <laughs> Last seven years, I think. So, yeah, I, I would agree with a majority of that. However, execution of that... Uh, you know, Metaverse, uh, Web 2, 2.5, whatever George is saying here. You know, uh, when we started .com, it was only Netscape there, right? As our interface in, right? And uh, Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, none of them existed. We, in fact, financed their data centers to get them .com ready for one of better words, right? 
<clears throat> we never went in to say this is 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.1. We never did that. All we said is how do we make people's life easy and how do we get them to save time and money so you don't have to trot up and go to Toys R Us to buy some toy for your kids. Uh, interesting story there as well. Uh, they said it will never work. People like to look filthy and bring little Johnny, go on the bike, and that's how they'll buy. And look, I, I told them even then. Um, and they didn't survive, and now they're resurfacing. So uh, some of the things I would say are, because of the internet now, the Web3, the Metaverse, the NFT, DeFi, all these cycles are happening, but happening a lot faster because we have access to info. What I don't see is where, uh, you know, 70, 80% of the solutions providers don't look at the basic problems, you know, being as a judge, even on the panel the other day, you know, hardly anyone said, this is the real life problem we're gonna solve, or they just go in at a niche market. So one thing George said is adoption, mass adoption, how to make it easy on the mobile. So if you can't do that metaverse all in one wallet, what we have all in one card, uh, my real universe, so I, what I like, what I buy, what I share, if it's not done simply, Play on a single super app or very few of these, then people don't have time to cut, paste, edit addresses to go and buy something or consume news and earn their tokens there and then switch it to another platform to uh, monetize it or convert it to fiat or whatever because fiat's not going to die. You know, No matter what we say, it's not going to die in the, this side of five years, right? So we've got to work with them Otherwise, if you say we are just a crypto and you know decentralized exchange or a decentralized platform, it doesn't exist really. You know, get real. Uh, look what Ripple have been doing. Embrace the banks to get into banking. You know, and that's why Swift and all these guys, after three, four decades, are actually changing the way they do that with the Mastercard visas and all the transactions. So, you know, in in summary, what I would say is whatever you guys are developing. If you don't make it idiot-proof and so simple that people don't have to think this is Web3 or cut-paste addresses, you know, just have your name, domain as your wallet, you know, at Myverse, for example, is my address. Send money there or receive it. And what happens in the background is nobody's business. When we did the internet, we didn't go around explaining, oh, your DNS server needs to be this and IP address is that. And we, Switch it on, switch it off. That's how simple we need to make. So us and people out there, we don't make it easy for people to adopt into this, uh, uh, this environment. But it will get seamless, that is for sure. Yeah, you're right. And I mean, I think, Diane, you're actually building a solution that is like really going into decentralization on the full tech stack. I mean, I recommend everybody to look at <clears throat> their web page. It's really a mouthful of stuff you're building from a decentralized browser to decentralized social media. You know, what is the approach you take? I mean, looking at what Ruth just said in terms of, you know, adoption, make it easy for people. How do you approach that? Exactly. I completely agree with the guys what they are saying. Basically, uh, one issue that we're having today in the community is that we're hyper fixating in calling us Web3 and not a hyper fixating in the solutions that we should be providing people, right? And in our case, basically, what we're working on is bringing the 2.0 uh, experience, to call it that way, uh, to Web3.0, because we understand that if we don't make it easy for people to understand it and to use it, then there's no space for us. And another thing that I would like to add is that in order for this community and this ecosystem to keep growing, still we're talking about, hey, yes, there's an NFT, there's a DeFi, and, and there's another solution. And they need, we need to foster this collaboration because there's no way we can uh, survive without collaboration in between projects. So there's space for everybody. And that's, I think, what we need to foster as a truly decentralized ecosystem. Okay, that basically means kind of you are trying to combine community with easy UI, easy UX, and this is the approach you take. So I totally agree. I would add in one more thing that, in my perspective, really is driving all this crypto adoption, which is greed <laughs> and making money on coins. And I guess, actually, that's, for me, one of the big differences between, you know, kind of all this old world with Yahoo and, you know, Google and all these things coming up. I mean, 
there was a big IPO wave, and you, you remember that in 1998, 1999. Woo, we were all going to the internet moon. But it was, it was slower. I always feel like crypto is the same on steroids. Things are going faster. People are kind of more greedy. And I mean, being kind of from the builder side in this space and from, a, from, from, a, from the perspective of somebody who is running companies and building projects, I've come to realize there's a few different perspectives. One is kind of the VC perspective where, you know, everybody's trying to place their bets and the bets they're making are based on the, on the tokenomics that these projects are providing. Then there's the perspective of the projects that need to raise funds to build a company, meaning they need to raise funds to run for two, three, five years until they, come their, uh, until they build up their product. And then there's the perspective of uh, investors and all these three obviously want to make money, but kind of with different interests in the background. Let me, uh, let me add to that, okay? Um, you know, a few years ago, we, we saw the ICO days, okay? And uh, I was shocked because it reminded me of the dot-com days when we started with the Java One conferences, right? And we used to have like 10,000 people around the world. We were doing teleconferences over the Cisco kind of scenarios, even in those days. And all these startups, <clears throat> we never had in its defense more than 10, maybe 20% of this flashy go to the moon and Lamborghinis kind of things, right? What's happening now is because money is so easily accessible, and I call that stupid money rather than smart money, you know, the, the the OGs, the GOATs, people like us, me specifically, I go through rigorous, um, very rigorous due diligence. And I see all these Lambo getters and flashy watches and cars and all these things, which drives this whole industry. And, and we know some of these culprits as well. Sorry to call them culprits. But they instill this mindset that money is so easy put your money here and it will go 1,000x, put your money there. Go, oh, I had someone trying to sell me some coin here yesterday as well and saying, oh, this is going to be a trillion dollar market cap. Hang on. It, how can you say this is going to be bigger than Bitcoin? And openly saying that, by the way, in this region is illegal, all right? So they don't realize this. Why? Because a lot of people do that, all right? <clears throat> Coming back to your thing about uh, venture capital thing, I think some of the VCs, because they've burnt their fingers a lot, uh, have realized that, you know, if someone's asking you for money and they've never managed a financial cash flow, which you also mentioned, what their burn rate is, you don't ask anyone out there. Do a test, go out there and ask them, what's your cash flow like? What's your burn rate like? What's your projection like? What's your revenue like for the next year, 12 months, 14 months, 18 months? You haven't got a clue. So how can you give them money to manage your money, never failed in their life. I look for failures as well, right? If someone's failed and gone through that phase, it makes them wiser, right? So these little things, uh, if I don't see them in a startup, whether it's a Web3 type of a developer or a blockchain developer or metaverse, whatever, I ask fundamentals first and then go to tech and tech differentiators, you know? Yeah. George, what do you think kind of makes a good business model in that sense? Like, what is, an, what is a few elements where you say, if you run and, and get money for a blockchain company, you know, what, what is it to, to, to really put attention on? Well, first, you need to have a business model. Uh, let's take, for example, an example, even a successful company <coughs> in this space. Let's say Revolut. How many people here have used uh, Revolut? Revolut is an organization that focused on two things, a uh, nice GUI and a very big community. So it's a multi-billion dollar company. But a bit like Amazon, uh, Revolut has not made any money. They, they have keep losing, but however, they're focused on customer acquisition. And one of their problems, at least Revolut specifically, is they, they don't have a necessarily thought of a profitable business model. They concentrated on the GUI and the community, <coughs> but their business model was kind of broken because they outsourced everything to everybody, a currency, cloud, and other elements. And when you put that, they were still offering free transaction fees. So where does the money come from? Then they came up with 
more sophisticated subscriptions. So they try to fix the business model a little bit after the customer acquisition. I think if you want a successful business, you have to run through the numbers before you start your business. Do you really have a business? Can you make money with that business? Are you providing a solution that, and the amount of money does not have to be a lot. Uh, we talked earlier about Maru when he mentioned, I want to create a solution that helps a billion people. Now, why are these billion people today? Well, we have a billion in Africa, we have a billion in India, we have two billion Muslims. So you, these are massive markets. So when you're trying to address these communities, you need to understand the pains that they have. And if you have the proper solution, even if you make just a few pennies that's it. for the solution, that's enough. You got your super unicorn as a result. It's not about making a lot of money from a few people. It's about making very small amounts of money from a lot of people. Let's take one of the successful companies in our business, which is Binance. Binance is concentrated on optimization. They use the Chinese model, which means we'll give you the lowest possible transaction fees, but we want lots of volume. But we give you consistent, successful business model. And this makes a success much more rapidly than any other thing. So optimize and have a proper business model. Uh, and if you have that, then the remaining parts uh, will create a successful business. So just to add to that, if you think how WhatsApp started, YouTube started, Google itself started, there was no money in the mind. Telegram started, yet there are multi, multi, multi-billion dollar valuations. Zero revenue. WhatsApp was doing losses of one, 100 to 500 million per annum. So it's more about volume, which is the reason why I said I want to touch those people. Even if it's few cents and they make more, 80% of our revenue and profits will go out even of reading news or seeing an advert. You know, you've got to change the mindset of this greed mm -hmm. as well, you know, and that's the Revolut being an, another good example. Absolutely. I mean, uh, and sorry, I, I think that also to add out on that, uh, when we were talking about decentralized web three businesses and the pivotal change that business models are making, is that we're not longer relying on marketing in the same way that SaaS <coughs> models or big companies like Google or Amazon did in order to uh, get users and how to manage that data inside in order to profit from that data and in web3 we're not doing we're not profiting from that data so we need to think on how we're going to monetize that in order to actually yep. be profitable Absolutely. businesses Absolutely. i agree 100 percent. and i mean it's i keep saying you know we're we are printing magic money and one of the fundamental difference for me between web2 and web3 is that you have the possibility to kind of print money out of nothing and you can find people who are buying your token right this is a great way to fund a business but at the end of the day and this is my uh, my recommendation to all of you, you know, it's, it's nothing new. It's the same old, it's the same old. And it's friggin' common sense to look into a business model to say, are these people actually selling something that has a market, that finds buyers, and that has a community to, you know, to go into this stuff. So it's actually not, you know, reinventing the wheel. It's just the same old in a new way, is it? Well, I look at technology as an acceleration mechanism. So in reality, being 35 years in technology, what we're doing is digitizing. So the things that we used to do in paper, now we do electronically. And this has a very big impact. I don't know if uh, Chris is in the audience or not. It's I one of the local so. companies. Uh, they help the largest telecom organization um, digitize their relationships with their suppliers. So here you have the largest telecom organization, over 50 operations around the world, thousands of suppliers. Today, this relationship is paper-based. So that means, oh, I want to order 1 million mobiles, I get 999,000, I need to do an adjustment. I want to order 1,000 cellular towers, I get 900, I need to do an adjustment. How much do you think this organization saves by implementing smart contracts as a relationship to their suppliers? over $400 million a year. So this is a perfect use case, very simple to implement. I mean, it took them one year and a half, two years, but it has a real use case for this organization. So something that before was done on paper, now is done electronically and it's done much faster. So this, when you apply it to all the new elements, like for example, 
I am a digital creator. I create art. I can automate the art that I create and have a direct relationship with the people that buy my art. Or I'm a singer. Or I'm a Formula One driver. Or I'm a football player, etc. So you have this direct relationship without intermediators via direct uh, digital relationship. And this is what we're doing. We're accelerating that. But at the end of the day, if you look behind the scenes, it's the old barter system that we have had all our lives. It's just that we have a new digital barter system. You're right. I, I remind, uh, it reminds me on one saying in, in innovation, that is, if you digitize a shitty dig uh, business process, it's still a shitty business process. So I think that's kind <laughs> of the simple truth, right? You kind of have to put some brain why technology is leveraging up something or reinventing something that can just be done better with technology, right? And we're seeing Uber or Airbnb that are just, you know, coming in with something that is really revolutionary in terms of process. Which leads me to, like, kind of all the NFT craze. I'm, I'm still so-so. <laughs> I see a lot of innovation coming in, and you guys are laughing already. I think, you know, the NFTs... They, they keep saying, in hindsight, it was inevitable in crypto. And it's kind of the obvious is happening. We have seen NFTs, which is amazing. You have now some suddenly digital goods that have value that they didn't have before. And we, I mean, since the history of the internet, we are kind of struggling to say, you know, how can we monetize on digital original identities? I mean, if I send you a mail, you just get a copy of my mail, right? Because it's still on the server I send it from and now it's on the server you have it. Now I can transfer something to you and we can attach value to that. So, you know, where is innovation coming into these business models and where is oh. sustainability coming into that? Yeah, I can, I can give you uh, some live examples on things we are doing, okay? Uh, let's, let's touch with the one George touched on on the telecom side, right? So uh, I was born and raised in Kenya. Uh, they had this thing called M-Pesa, which was one of the world's first uh, disruptor in terms of SMS-based paying. Why? Because majority of people have mobile phones more than complicated things. Majority of people can relate to an SMS way of buying, selling, and cutting the banking system. However, what they did was, sorry to say it, they really abused the lower income people with very high transactional fees. So one of the things we are putting together in our banking app is a, a credit and loan uh, system where people get a credit scoring live through various inputs. Uh, it is one of the top four that's being deployed by quite a few banks. And we're gonna do microfinancing of even the mobile phones, but through uh, what I call Coming back to that impact way, a lot of people can't afford clever smartphones. So when they receive the ads on the app, that's all they got to see. Mm. Should they click on it, all this gets monetized. So the greed bit is taken out. And 80% of that revenue goes back to the user. And then we cr do a loan microfinance uh, for the mobile phone itself. And depends on how many points, for one or better words, they've earned, they can buy or pay for their mobile phone. So it virtually comes almost free compared to the greed model where uh, people are charging 40, 50, 60 percent APRs on getting a mobile phone in these countries. And that's ridiculous. NFT, and, and by the way, they are identified through their own NFT yeah, uh, as a person. Innovative way in everyone. We are all concerned with food, water and health, okay? So now imagine me with the Maru NFT. Uh, I have so many things about me from my blood, pressure, uh, you know, your diabetes or sugar or whatever it is, all right? Whatever problems or healthy things you have. Touch wood, I don't have any of those, but that can be an NFT where all these farmers are paying billions in doing R&D on how a certain drug acts with someone. So I can now, it's my data, it's not the government's data, right? I can say, I'm taking X, Y, and Z pills. I have something over here that measures certain stats and does live transmissions to even the pharma companies 
to sell that data because now you've given them live data rather than a Mickey Mouse rat and monkeys type of data, which is where they do their testing on how certain drugs work based on certain conditions. Now you've got real live data. It's my NFT, my personal thing. If I choose to sell it for the benefit of improving medicine, I should be also credited for it, right? Because Absolutely. save them doing R&D and all these things on Mickey Mouse stuff, right? So that's another live example we're putting together as well, right? That's a good use for NFTs. All this stuff you see with songs and art and all that, yeah, sure enough, I did one last year, but I used it with a use case and a utility based on the NFT. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of really the direction where, where it's going. Uh, yeah, I want to talk, good. see, not all NFTs are the same. First NFT technology has been around for five years. Yeah. The first NFT was called CryptoKitties, <coughs> crashed the Ethereum blockchain, for those that remember. Yeah, and long then long. everybody forgot it for four years, and then everything came back. But today, NFTs are about trust, identity, and uh, relationship control of the data. So you have some NFTs, for example, could be uh, your university degree. So this is not monetizable, but it's a valid identity case. It can be your passport. This is very specific use cases of NFTs. Then there's NFTs that are pure digital. So this could be the artistic music, um, pieces of art and all, etc. And then there's NFTs that are associated with, for example, uh, monetizing real world assets. Could be buildings, or so real estate, could be gold, could be other assets. So that means these are asset-backed NFTs. And then there's people that have created NFTs, for example, even as mutual funds. So today, if you're invent, uh, in, uh, investing in the various DeFi protocols, and I saw this yesterday with a discussion, it's very complicated for many of you to understand which protocol is good, which one is not. So what these guys have done is they have created an NFT, and the NFT is like a mutual fund in each of these DeFi protocols. I buy the NFT, is like I buy a share in this mutual fund. So NFTs have many applications, have uh, identity, uh, authority, and direct relationship, and can be traded. Now, the best uses cases of NFT are still to be made. Exactly. Uh, and the ones that will be successful are the ones that are able to create that relationship between the people that create value and the people that actually will use that value in the real world. I agree. Diane, yeah. no, what do you absolutely. think? Absolutely. I think that right now we're just scratching the surface in terms of what NFT uses are today. And we're kind of stuck in the fancy monkeys and zombies and stuff, and which is marvelous. I mean, there's people actually talking about uh, things that wouldn't be talking about a couple of years back. And that's fantastic. But again, just like Joe saying, we're just scratching the surface. And I would love to see, for example, going to a hospital and being my medical history here in Bangkok or in Timbuktu using my NFT with my medical records, for example, uh, having my household and having an NFT. And I think one marvelous thing that's happening now is that travel agencies, uh, well, there's a startup now that and they're using NFTs to trade um, plane tickets because you know when you put a name on it it's very hard to change it now with an nft you actually get the nft for the plane ticket and then you you, you can change it or not if you're not going to use it so i think we're just again just starting out and uh what i would say is that i i, I love nfts i think they're very important but i do like to see an underlying project and an, an underlying uh, solidity um structure about it and not just make it nfts out of uh, random ideas and because we're making NFTs, which is, again, great. But I think we just need to go deeper and find the actual use cases for people to adopt them. Amazing. I totally agree. I mean, it's kind of the inevitable that we see a remix of what we have seen, that we have seen DeFi and NFTs coming together. Guys, we have one minute <coughs> left, and the topic of this uh, is trends. So for all the crowd here listening to us, I would love to hear your opinion, what are the top three trends that we see coming, going out of 2022, going into 2023? Diane, what do you think? Three well, words. Well, I think, uh, first of all, is uh, a very big pivot in e-commerce, in Web3. 
that's the one I'm, I'm interested about. I see, for example, how many e-commerce will be deployed on point. Uh, I'm dreaming about it. And I'm very interested in the metaverse, but I, uh, still, I, I, I'd like to see a little bit more about that. And again, how the users will adopt it. I think we all seen many news about that lately. And the other thing, it's aiming for true decentralization. Like, I think we're getting to that point where we either need it and adopt it, or... I love that. <laughs> Mru, your top three. Yes, yeah, so um, we're building a huge ecosystem based on some of these top three. So I touched on my real universe. So everything that touches me, meaning all of us, personalized universe. I don't care whether it's metaverse, web two, web three, whatever. What do I touch? What do I need? What solves my uh, problems in the most cost-effective and time-efficient way? So that has to be something to do with uh, proper super power wallets, Web3 enabled, and fiat crypto transparency and things like that. So that's one. Two is, my view is the biggest resources in the world is water, food, energy, things along those lines. So impacting that in a sensible way with any form of technology, don't have to tell people go and buy a bloody EV car or something like that, it ain't gonna happen. Do something today that is practical, even if it's displacing water every time you flush the toilet or something with something that flushes less, for example, because it takes a lot of time and energy and electricity power to distribute it, right? And same with the food as well, how it's made and how it's consumed, things like that. Energy, data centers, I, I, I won't go there. One of the solutions we have is how to reduce uh, energy consumptions in huge data centers by over 90%. So you don't have to go out and do silly things, you know, save on just air conditioning. These miners, especially in our space, takes a lot of heat. So that's the second trend. Anyone who addresses that, it's huge money. And three, it helps with the planet and social impact of the people. Those are my three trends going forward Fair where point. tech is going to play big. George, what about you? My three important trends to be successful as we move forward. Uh, the first one is anything associated with impact solutions, whether they happen to be uh, carbon credit related or trying to solve a real world problem. Um, number two would be solutions that focus on the user experience. So the ones that have the best user experience are the ones that will succeed the better. And the third one, is I still remains always with me is security and safety. All these solutions are creating much larger attack spaces. Yeah. Uh, last year, we lost over $3 billion in uh, digital money. So the pace at which we're losing sure is increasing. More than that. So, so <laughs> this is the documented yeah, yeah. side. Um, so that really means if we do not address security, we're amplifying the problem rather than solving it. Perfect timing, guys. <laughs> My top three are social five. <laughs> Boom, right the gun. Right timing. Perfect. Social five, <laughs> cross chain, and ask me next month because it will be something new I don't see now. Thank you, guys. That was a fantastic so and very engaged discussion. Have a great day, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you for listening. Pleasure. My